I think the reason why I, I kept with Terrace House is just because, like, the first impression, like, the first scene in Aloha State is, like, Lauren walking in. And I was just like, <laughs> yo! <laughs> Big <laughs> symptom. <laughs> hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Kota Kota Podcast. Remember, <laughs> smash the like button. <laughs> Yeah, so today we're talking to Hiro Watanabe, who's part of the Japanese national basketball team and currently playing for the Ryukyu Golden Kings in Okinawa. And he just finished playing in the Olympics for Team Japan. So in the podcast, we talk about his unique story of becoming a professional basketball player and joining the Olympics, as well as his current situations with being in Japan and the Olympic situation. Yeah, so as always, we have bonus clips on Patreon if you want to support the podcast, but... Yeah, hope you guys enjoy the conversation. Hope you guys enjoy. Yeah, so Hugh, can you give us a quick background of who you are and where you're at today? Yeah, so I'm Hugh Hoagland or Watanabe Hugh, depends if US or Japan. I'm um, just coming off the Olympics with the Japanese national or men's national basketball team. And currently I'm in Okinawa to join my new pro team, the uh, Ryukyu Golden Kings. And yeah, just vacation right now and doing a podcast love to see it love to see it like i i you were interested in multiple sports right volleyball kind of being another Mm -hmm. big one right kind of um Mm -hmm. when did you kind of get interested in basketball to begin with so basketball was always like the sport that i played like it was just always there you know throughout my entire life right ever since i can remember uh but i was going to be a volleyball player first I uh, got that in seventh grade, got really good my sophomore year in high school. And then there was talks of like me joining the college national team for USA. And I almost made that team and being a part of like the super elite pipeline for the volleyball players for like a couple of years uh, with the A1 camps and stuff like that. But um, it kind of blew up in my face and oh, switched over to basketball. Yeah. <laughs> oh man so i guess you kind of rode the constant after that yeah i mean it, basketball was always there and then i was just good enough without really taking it seriously to somehow land a scholarship <laughs> <laughs> what was the whole story of you kind of landing that scholarship was it was it ever like expected for you um no i never thought i was a d1 basketball player much less Olympian, much less national team for Japan, <laughs> much less pro. You know, like, it, it, it's still kind of unbelievable because I never thought I was good enough to be, like, even there's, like, an Iolani Classic where all, like, the top prep teams come. And, and, like, just watching those guys, I was like, oh, there's no way I'm at that level, you know? Right. But mm. how I got the scholarship, my teammate, Robbie Mann, he had a family friend who watched me. And he's a UCSB basketball grad. And the coach there recruited me, like, came all the way down to Hawaii and said, like, yeah, you're really good. Like, we can make you into something really good. And then he got fired. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> so, yeah, he, he got fired. And the new coach came in. And he was like, no, I don't think you're that good. I think you're a D3 player. <laughs> We're not going to offer you a scholarship. And I was like, wow. That's crazy. <laughs> but the, the old UCSB coaching staff kind of went to bat for me and set me up at Portland. Yeah, University of Portland with Terry Porter. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> what a turnaround. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a whirlwind. Like, I was on a – I remember I was on a van in a volleyball – school volleyball trip. And, like, it was on the radio because we're in California, like, close to SB. So it's, like, local radio news. Just like Bob Williams got fired today, I was like, "No, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> there goes there goes my D one experience right there out the window." <laughs> I didn't know because that was that was like last quarter semester year too. I was like, "I don't know what I'm going to do." Right, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I thought I was screwed. Yeah. Oh man. So I guess kind of then now going to Portland, how was kind of the whole collegiate experience still kind of, I mean, you got the, you got the scholarship, you're playing basketball now. Yeah. I mean, I get there. I didn't work out at all the summer going into it because 
you, you know, I never really had to work hard at basketball in Hawaii. Everyone's kind of short <laughs> and yeah, not as tall as me, but, uh, you know, showed up, there's a seven, three senior center that's been there all four years and I'm just, yeah, getting my ass kicked every day and I had to redshirt cause I just wasn't ready. Right. Um, yeah. And those, all those three years, I just wasn't, I didn't even take basketball seriously then too. I was more interested in other activities you can say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I was, I was, I was not a very good like pro or not a very good athlete, not taking care of myself, like all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So did you ever like imagine yourself as an Olympian at that point in your kind of basketball journey? So that's that's like a whole ride too cuz freshman year during my redshirt year they sent me to Japan for the first time right. Kumamoto. Uh-huh. And then I went there and I killed it and then they're trying to bring me back for the qualifiers and then the coaches were just like hey you're really good like we can see you in this position 4 years down the road like or three years down the road, like we could really see you playing for the Olympic team. Like you just need to develop, but come back. We really want you to play now on the national team. I was getting really stoked. I was thinking like, Oh, the Olympics is going to happen. Like this is all going to happen. Get put together. It didn't because DP wouldn't let me go back because of like team chemistry reasons. Oh, and, uh, yeah. Um, and then 2019 world cup rolls around. I had a really good year at Portland and then I'm thinking like, I'm just going to walk in and get a spot and be like the sixth man off the bench. You know what I mean? Like that, that was really my mindset coming in. Right. And then I break the tendon in my thumb in camp Oh. and I get really, really sick, like 104 degree fever kind of oh sick. Oh my God. <laughs> and I absolutely folded. And after that, especially the fever, came back to practice and I couldn't even run up and down the court slide, much less compete at a world cup level with like Rui and Utah and everyone. Right. So I got cut. And when I got cut from that team, I thought there's no way I'm making the Olympic team. And then, you know, quit the team from Portland, went to Davis, thought I was going to have a good year, figured it out that this was injured, had to get surgery <laughs> like I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think I was gonna make this team at all. Right. Yeah. Man, what a so, what a whirlwind. <laughs> so yeah. I, I guess like rewinding a little bit, how did you even get like a scouted for of the Japanese national team? Because I guess mm-hmm. at this point you're kind of really focusing kind of on the U.S. side, right? Kind of playing in the states, mm-hmm. kind of even for volleyball, kind of going for the U.S. national team when when you were kind of going for that. But how did you kind of get on the radar for Japan? Yeah, so it was like a combination of two things. My mom sent a cold email. She <laughs> said, hey, my, my son's like really tall and plays basketball for D1. Like, come check him out. And then um, the general manager of the team is really close with one of my teammates or one of my teammates from Portland. Oh. Because one of my teammates from Portland played high school in Japan. Oh, Interesting. Yeah, and he speaks, like, five languages. His name's Tahiro Diabate. Nuts. He's a really good dude. But, like, because he was my teammate, a new crusher, and my mom emailed crusher. They, yeah, they came to um, Portland to scout me in a practice. And, and just for some context, crusher is, like, his nickname, the, the scout's yeah. name. I yeah, see. yeah. So, Toy- Tomoya Higashino-san. He's the guy who's kind of built Japan basketball to where it is right now i see i see yeah so he, him and coach lamas the head coach that just coached in the olympics came to portland to see how good i was yeah i see and looks like they liked what they saw <laughs> yeah <laughs> got you there Luckily. so so Luckily i guess kind of you had like two kind of branching routes here because like it was kind of tough, like kind of being in shape the first three years and kind of having that red shirt year as a freshman, but at the same time, you're just destroying everyone in Japan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that first camp in Kumamoto it felt really good. Like I was scoring a lot. I was being really aggressive, rebounding, blocking shots. Right. Like, you know, in Portland, I was getting my ass kicked by 
our senior center. <laughs> and then in Japan, it was just like, oh, my God, I'm actually good at basketball again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, those two different things happened my freshman year. Right. Um, yeah, and then it kind of flipped. Like, in Portland, I was doing really, really well mm-hmm. my redshirt freshman season. Like, I had uh-huh. a really good year. Right. And then came back for Japan for the World Cup and was not good at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So at at that point, did you like get? Were you able to get like a feel for the team? Like, did you like be, like get to know like Rui and um, Utah, for example? No, I mean it was weird because the first time the World Cup was the first time I spent like extended amount of time with the senior national team, right. like over a month. Uh huh. And my Japanese isn't that good, and almost all of their English isn't that good either (laughs) so i was i got kind of isolated a little bit it wasn't until like i came back this year with my japanese a little bit better and yeah this this time around in the olympic camp like everyone i was a lot more closer to everyone i opened myself up a lot more and it helped me out for sure yeah i see i see and and i guess like Maybe going along the lines of for Japanese, how did you kind of improve your Japanese? So, like, I guess for some context, you didn't really speak Japanese as much up until, like, leading up to the, towards the Olympics. Mm-hmm. I mean, Davis has a huge Japanese-American uh, community. So I just joined the, you know, the jazz club, and they have, like, these Kaiwa like Wednesdays and Kaiwa Fridays, just go to that. Um, and then just like watch a lot of Terrace House. <laughs> <laughs> watch a lot of Terrace House. Yeah, those two things combined helped me out a lot. Plus I was injured and I didn't, I wasn't really playing, so I had a lot of time on my hands. I, I guess, I guess for, do you have like a, a favorite season of Terrace House? Specific. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I I can talk about Terrace House. Like we can stop talking about basketball. And we can just go into Terrace House. Right <laughs> would you want to go on the show? No, I would never want to go on that show. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. But Aloha State was by far my favorite. Yeah, because Hawaii, Hawaii and Lawrence I. Yeah, <laughs> those two things. Those two things. Yeah. Uh, good, good, fair point, fair point. <laughs> I can't argue with that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the reason why I, I I kept with Terrace House, even like, you know, I didn't really like the Karuizawa season or like even the one before Aloha State. Right. It's just because like the first impression, like the first scene in Aloha State is like Warren walking in. And right. I was just like, <laughs> yo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, big symptom. <laughs> for sure. But uh, you got me right from frame one. <laughs> from frame one. After the open yeah, frame one. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Um similar experience here and you gotta gotta simp sometimes, you know, but <laughs> yeah. It's it's all part of the process. It's all part of the process. But I mean, that's really interesting because on on our podcast, we have a lot of listeners who are are currently learning Japanese and do a lot through Mm. immersion learning. So I Mm. I guess like and and a lot of it is like they'll go watch some Japanese media and kind of learn from take phrases and kind of practice those while also doing other forms of immersion. But would you say that was kind of accurate in a little way of how you're able to pick up some phrases in, in Japanese. Yeah. Cause Terrace house, like it's actually like real people talking to each other, you know, like, right. Or as real as you could get for a reality TV show. <laughs> and like, instead of anime, like anime is like, well over the top, you know, like those phrases don't really work <laughs> in real life. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you, yeah. So Terrace house was like a lot better. Um, for me, and then taking that and like putting that into like the Kaiwa and UC Davis, and yeah, it was just a lot better. I see, a kind of combination of Terrace House plus real practical experience coming in. Yeah, I mean, kind of getting back to the kind of your journey to joining the Olympic team, I mean, 
it, like you're mentioning before, like it's kind of very improbable from what it kind of seemed based off all the circumstances you kind of went through. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I mean, especially leading up to your injury, right? It, it seems like, oh man, like it's it's all bad now. <laughs> like, but yeah. I, I guess in a way, the pandemic did hit it like a a fortunate time for you, right? <laughs> in like, no, it definitely did. It definitely did. I mean, like Davis. Besides, like the surgery, like physically fixing me, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really thought like the coaching staff, the people in Davis, um, you know, just my teammates, like just being in that space helped me grow a lot as a person right? and helped me mentally grow up just maybe a couple of years. <laughs> so, yeah, I ran into a lot of failure and a lot of pain that I caused and then seeing that caused me to like, Oh, I need to make changes in my life in order to like live a better life. Right. And those changes, I think were the main reason why I made this team. I see yeah. for after Davis, right. Cause there was some time before actually going to the national team, right. Did you, you ended up kind of going back to Hawaii and also kind of playing professionally, right. In Japan. So, so no, it was, Davis straight to Japan straight to quarantine Japan. for the national team. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. You, you actually got tested false positive, right? Probably three days before we were finding out who got cut. Um, in those three days, I false positive twice. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> What's going through your head? <laughs> the first one, I was just like, you know, I was, I was, like, taking my temperature at least, like, 20 times. <laughs> like, just trying to see, like, oh, did it go up, like, another, like, 0.1, like, degrees? Like, did it go up? Did it go up? Like, I don't feel bad. Like, you know, just racing, racing, talking to my agent, talking to my family. Like, hey, I might not even make this team now because um, I could apparently. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, you know, we went to the, went to the local hospital and... Iwate or Fukushima. We were in Fukushima. We went to the local hospital in Fukushima and they did their little thing and they said, like, you don't have COVID. And I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Would you have definitely been cut if, if you had COVID? Yeah, 100%. Like, <laughs> oh. I'm, the 12th, I'm the 12th guy on this team. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm the bottom of the roster. Like, I'm expendable. Like, they could just be like, all right, slide you out, put like, Kosuke Takeuchi and or Joji Takeuchi and like it's just that easy. <laughs> like compared to like if Rui got COVID, we're definitely going to be like, okay, Rui, take two weeks off. <laughs> please, please come back. We don't even care. We don't even care if like you're out of shape. Just be on the court. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. And then how was it that second time? <laughs> the second time it was it was more people. So like I didn't feel bad. Oh. Like it was it was me, one of the captains. And our best shooter. So I was like, okay, like if they just send me home and keep these guys, it's gonna look a little, look a little messy. So I'm okay with that. You know what I mean? Like I, I have some safety here. Right. But the second time, I didn't really freak out about it because I just thought, yeah, it's definitely the test. That's faulty, not. Nice. Yeah. And what was that whole feeling like when you got like the official confirmation? Hey, you're on the Olympic the Japanese Olympic team, you. Yeah, that was, that was crazy too. Cause you know, that whole day, like we know, Oh, okay. At the end of the day, like the guy, June, June's like the interpreter. He's the one who contacts you to like go meet with llamas if you're cut. Right. So we're all just like, you know, we have our phones on us and we're just like, okay, when's that text coming in? When's that text coming in? What is going on? Um, so we're just all nervous and, I was so nervous that I had to like just do something. So I went over to the treatment room to get treatment from our trainer. Right. And me and him were like just talking about random stuff just to try to get their mind off it. And like at the time, like a lot of emails were coming in for me for no reason. So like my phone was going off and every time it's just like, okay, let's check, let's check, let's check. But eventually one of our vets, Kosuke Takeuchi, was the guy I was pretty much competing for for the last spot. 
uh-huh. comes in and starts shaking everyone's hand. And he's just like, oh, good luck to you guys. Like, I'm going home to Utsunomiya. Like, they cut me. Um, good luck, good luck, good luck kind of thing. Right. And he leaves. And then, like, me and my trainer just, like, look at each other like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and just, like, complete eye contact for, like, a good 10 seconds. And then our manager, Takuya, who, you know, he basically does everything logistics-wise. Right. He comes in. Looks at me, he's just like, you're in. <laughs> and I was like, literally fall off the bed. I'm just like, oh, shit, oh, shit. And, like, I start breaking down, and I thought I could hold it. But, uh-huh. like, nah, I had to go straight back to my room and, like, cry for, like, a good 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> a good 20 minutes. A good 20-minute intense crying on the floor kind of thing. Yeah, I'm not ashamed to say that. Yeah, definitely did that. No shame at all. I mean, I bet you gave him, like, the hardest handshake of his entire life. Like, <laughs> you're, like, so grateful. No, we I mean, <laughs> he walked in and said, you're in, and it just, like, bolted out. It was just <laughs> me and my trainer. <laughs> oh, no, I, I meant the, I meant the, um, the, your vet who got cut <laughs> when he was wishing everyone oh, good yeah, luck. Oh, yeah, when Cole, when Cole was like, yeah, yeah, I shook his hand, and I was just like, yeah, good luck, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no way did you just what yeah i was i was yeah i was out of my body the whole time for sure and i guess now kind of leading into the actual olympics i mean this is one of the most hotly debated like olympics in a long time Mm. with i mean all the circumstances around it i mean japan Mm. didn't even want to have the olympics happen at many points in the process yeah but i mean it's happened and I guess it's taking place in sort of like a bubble format, right? With the mm-hmm. Olympic Village. How was that kind of whole experience like kind of first arriving to the scene and you're kind of seeing athletes of like from everywhere around the world, mm-hmm. like world class mm-hmm. athletes just everywhere? Yeah. I mean, it's cool because like you see like the rowers who are obviously like, you know, like rowers, track athletes, people that are like, I don't know. But, like, they're obviously, like, really fit and really good at their sport. Right. And then, like, you see, like, the super famous people like Luka Doncic and Kevin Durant and, like, Paul Gasol. And it's just, like, it's, like, a whole mix of, like, super elite athletes. And it's kind of, it just has, like, this college town feel. Like, everyone is just really, really good at their sport. So, like, you don't get, like, the sport treatment. Like, you just, you're just all, like, the same level Maybe Luca and Kevin Durant, like they're up here, <laughs> but like, uh-huh. just, you know, ninety nine percent of the population, like everyone's like level. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. So, so do you see Luca and Kevin Durant in the village, just like chilling? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're just walking around. Luca, especially, he would just like walk around, and not a lot of people would ask him for pictures because he would had it up and sunglasses and kind of look kind of normal. Uh huh. Um, yeah. But, yeah, Kevin Durant and those guys would get mobbed a little bit. <laughs> How are the, like, the conditions um, that you're staying in? Because I saw the, um, the athletes were sleeping on, on, on a cardboard bed. Uh, yeah, I mean, the mattresses were actually, like, really comfortable because you could, like, customize your own mattress to, like, fit your body. So, like, the top part could be really soft, the middle part could be, like, medium, and the bottom part could be hard. Or like however you want it and like they had like a machine to like really measure that like it was kind of high tech yeah so it was actually really the mattress is really good the rooms were i mean luckily we're team japan so we get our own rooms so that was <laughs> that was pretty good too yeah so it was yeah pretty good the food's okay food was really good yeah like the meats were all overcooked, but everything else is really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, you would have, you would have expected it to be like the top class food, and they just overcook everything, man. I mean, they don't want any liability. Like someone shows up with like food poisoning because of under. Yeah, true. That would true, be a right. <laughs> Oh so. man. Yeah, <laughs> that would be rough. That would be rough. <laughs> so, what was yeah. I guess in terms of like sanitization? Then was there just like hand sanitizer like everywhere and kind of like a mask protocol? Yeah, mask protocol, hand sanitizer everywhere. But like, you know, there's just 
the cafeteria is so big and like so many people go through there at certain times and the weight room is big but like so many people work out there too it's just like <clears throat> it's a big problem I, I could tell like if i was organizing that event i'd be really scared right <laughs> right oh man it does sound very sketch <laughs> yeah to, yeah but i mean glad um I mean, it looks like so far so good for for the majority of um, the Olympics. I mean, yeah, yeah. So definitely love to see that. Definitely love to see that. But I guess another big part about the Olympics was that you got to participate in the opening ceremony, right? Mm. Yeah, that that was wild. That I can't really describe the moments that happened, especially like. You know, Rui Hachimura was the flag bearer, so, you know, the basketball team especially got a little bit more attention because you get dropped off, and then, like, you walk through around the outside, basically, of the arena, and, like, everyone that's, like, a volunteer is just there to see you, and, like, they're all super excited to see you, Rui, and then, yeah, it's weird. And then you head down into the arena and, like, to the ground floor, and that whole time, I can't even describe to you what it's like. <laughs> like, I kind of just blanked out, you know, like, again, another out-of-body experience. Um, and then head, walking into, like, actually walking around um, and doing all the waving and stuff, like, biggest goosebumps of my life, for sure. Oh, man. Yeah. And it's kind of funny because a lot of people heard from, like, um, I guess their family and friends watching, like the camera was on the left side. So you just see everyone just mobbing the left side. And then, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it, uh, I, yeah. It was, it was a big, everyone mobbing the left side, everyone like trying to get on TV. But like, I was just trying to like enjoy the moment and like, throughout a couple shakas that was really all my goal <laughs> represent yeah. the island well yeah yeah represent the island for sure oh man yeah i guess like what were, some, what were some of the big like experience takeaways that you kind of had for maybe your game and kind of mm-hmm. how like you want to like approach this next kind of chapter for you mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i mean i think there's like two big things that i kind of take away from it first is like you know there's a timeline for the next world cup which is 2023 and it's going to be in okinawa the basketball world cup oh wow so that's hella that's hella cool um but like i have 23 months to close the gap between me and like the ruiz the yudas the yutas to like make japan basketball better right and in the other sense like i'm an olympian like I don't care who I go up against. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. We, we played France, Slovenia, Argentina, Spain, and like, that's as big as it gets, you know? Yeah. So, like, if I have a bad game, whatever. If I have a good game, whatever. It's just being in the moment and, you know, drawing on this experience to recenter myself if I ever need it. Right, right. Oh, man. Yeah, kind of. I guess going towards the one of the Anthony Davis on the Olympic teams before he joined became went to the NBA and look at him now. I mm-hmm. mean, hey, yeah, he was the college kid. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully we have that same kind of development here in Okinawa. Oh yeah, hey, the yeah. Kodakata podcast will be rooting for you all the way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. We, we got sure, you. Sure. We got you. We got you. But I guess now, kind of closing out here. I mean. We, we usually have kind of a section towards the end where it's just a message to the listeners on the spot here, though the lights are on shining bright, brighter than the Olympics, brighter than the Olympics. I'm going to say that right now. <laughs> um, if I had to say anything, I mean, advice is advice, whatever, but like whatever listeners, like if you want to get better at Japanese, whether you're watching this for fun, I don't know why you're here watching uh, first of all, thank you, but at the end of the day, your life, your chapters, your book, write it however you want it. I mean, it's just 
you may think it's like big and scary. I don't know what is big and scary, but like as long as you start doing it, it becomes less scary for sure. Yeah, not not really eloquent, but that's my thing right there. Hey guys, thanks for making it to the end of the podcast. Real quick though, I want to go shout out our patrons: Faraz, Brit vs Japan, or Matt, Zach, or Wade Hunter, Alan Card, KH90, Drew, Jack, Yui, and Sad Boy. So. Usually we go and ask you guys to subscribe at the end, but if you have not obliterated like button, I'm going to have to ask you to not subscribe. Yeah, if you guys subscribe, I'll see you on the next episode talking about Japan once again here with Eric. But if you didn't subscribe, um, hope you have to watch School Days.